Well, comrades, can I first uh, start by repeating how pleased and proud we are to have a speaker from the Revolutionary Socialist of Egypt here at Marxism. Across the globe, but also, of course, 
that central to any revolutionary project must be the political developments which are necessary to support and to carry through a socialist project. It won't happen spontaneously, and therefore the primacy of politics that Lenin spoke about, the central political events around which forces gather and which become crucial moments in the development of the struggle. And the message of the elections from the 23rd and 24th of May was that people were not tired of the revolution, that people voted for candidates of the revolution, that in particular the vote for Hamdi Salafi, over 20% of the vote victor in Cairo and Alexandria, largely because he presented a series of demands that in some way chimed with a feeling for social change inside society is of great importance to us. And the struggle now becomes of whereby the minority that wants to carry through the entirety of the revolutionary project in Egypt, that wants to complete the revolution, that wants not a choked off process which allows the old regime to return, but instead the process of permanent revolution to carry through to its summation, to see full workers' power in Egypt and for that revolution to spill out across the globe. That is the genuine potential inside Egypt, a potential whose realisation will clearly involve solidarity from across the globe, but also centrally will be about how revolutionaries organise inside the country itself, using every method of struggle using every tool that's available to them, from the strikes, to the protest, to the occupation, to the electoral process, to see how they can force through the unresolved issues that exist inside Egypt at the moment. The Egyptian revolution, the fall of Mubarak, triggered off the emergence of all of those social questions inside society. It was not enough to simply see the fall of one tyrant. It was not enough to see simply a pause in repression. It was necessary to see a carrying through of all the social and political questions. And what we will hear from Hossam is the importance of socialist politics in the revolutionary movement today. That what we are centrally involved in as a class across the globe is solidarity with the Egyptian revolution, but also building in our own countries the idea of a revolutionary force that can stand in solidarity with the Egypt, but can also carry through a similar process inside our own country. That is what's so incredibly exciting about the Egyptian revolution, and why I hope you'll welcome Hossam to speak today. people in a protest, 
in front of the press syndicate in downtown Cairo, you know, we would feel that we've done really something. Um, so everybody was demoralized because of this. But at the same time, what those activists did not understand or did not conceive is that literally four blocks away from the press syndicate, there were thousands of workers who were besieging the parliament, demanding all sorts of demands related to social justice, related to their own factories, related to their own sector, and I mean, even columnists at the time described it as the Cairo's high park, uh, more or less. Anyone with a plight used to descend on the parliament uh, uh, then. And this was something unprecedented. But those activists actually dismissed those strikes, like many on the left too. And they dismissed those strikes as just economic strikes. And some of them even used to uh, use like foul language, you know, when they describe the workers as selfish, they are only there like for their own demands. If you throw like some peanuts, you know, I mean, at them, they will just, you know, go back home. They don't care about politics. This is not politics. Oh my God, even some of them are like carrying Mubarak's posters, you know, begging him to intervene. How come they don't understand that it's Mubarak, you know, I mean, who's the cause of all of this? And my argument and the argument of my comrades that actually what's going on is quite political. You cannot dismiss it. Why? When you are living in a country under emergency law that bans this, the assembly of five people together, and then you get 27,000 workers getting together in order to strike over bread and butter issues, they are effectively breaking the emergency law. When strike leaders mobilize for industrial actions at their workplace over bread and butter issues, but knowing that outside their factory gates there will be the central security forces and the notorious state security police who are waiting for them to come out in order to snatch them, kidnap them, torture them, uh, even take their families on occasions as hostages, they are effectively taking a political decision to go on this strike. And when you find a layer, an increasing layer of strike leaders who actually started theorizing about the situation and looking at the bigger picture, raising demands for the whole class, not just for themselves, like the national minimum wage, which had not been changed since 1986. At the time, they are not only asking for demands of their own factory, they are asking it for the entire class. This is actually politics. When you start finding industrial actions in workplaces that is also directed against the state-run uh, uh, bureaucratic unions that we have in Egypt and workers forming independent unions, this is politics. Uh, we saw potential in this, and that's why we were extremely optimistic about the prospects. But did we have a timing for when the revolution exactly is going to happen? Of course not. And I would be lying if I tell you that on the morning of January 25th, you know, everybody was ready and we had like a clear plan like what most of the documentaries now uh, on the Egyptian revolution try to uh, uh, picture. That, you know, the Egyptian revolutionaries from the beginning, they had you know, a plan, and on that day they descended and they did this and they did that. Honestly, I mean, there was so much confusion. And even in the meetings in the run-up to January 25th, when someone asked the question, so after we reached the square, what are we going to do? I mean, everybody laughed, and they said, well, if we manage to reach the square. But we did in the end. Um, let me fast forward a little bit. Um, I mean, the events of the 18 days you are definitely familiar with, and if you're not, then you can just Google them, um, so I don't waste your time. But I want to fast forward a little bit. Today is the 8th of July, and it's the first anniversary of the 8th of July sitting in Tahrir Square, which was probably the second major mobilization by the revolutionaries following the suspension of the, um, the first Tahrir occupation of the 18 days. This 8th of July sit-in was triggered by clashes between the families of the martyrs and the police forces. And that culminated in that sit-in which was supported by the Egyptian revolutionaries. And the sit-in had like, you know, several demands, the most important of which was, of course, retribution and uh, avenging, you know, I mean, the martyrs who died. Um, and
and revolutionary trials to be given to, to Mubarak, to the interior ministry uh, uh, leaders, um, as well as anyone who was involved in the killings uh, of the Egyptian protesters during the 18 days. And that second was crushed brutally by the army. And the pictures that you see from that suspension, the brutal suspension of the second is, is horrific. I mean, Egyptian officers of the special forces and the military police dressed in those fatigues that look exactly, you know, I mean, like their American counterparts, even with the cowboy hats, carrying whips, carrying machine guns. They even stormed like Amina Mosque, uh, uh, that was Omar Matar Mosque, which is a famous mosque in Tahrir Square. Um, and I also remember the mass demoralization that happened among everybody. And probably for the second time after February 2011, you started hearing the revolution is lost, we're lost, we're screwed, you know, I mean, now the army has taken over, there is no hope that people actually gave up on the revolution. Well, the army had to make some compromises after they crushed our Satan at the time. And this was putting Mubarak on trial on a televised, uh, uh, actually, uh, trial. And for someone like me, who grew up more or less like politically in the 1990s dirty war between the Islamists and the Mubarak's regime, where dictatorship was at its height, where you could not whisper Mubarak's name or talk about him over the phone. Now to see him in a cage, humiliated, and he's being treated as a convict or treated as a defendant or someone who's accused. I mean, I always cried when I was watching this, even when I know that this is a mock trial. And the visuals of Mubarak inside the cage was being aired everywhere, and everyone was like in a state of shock, and they felt actually empowered. And you started reading, you know, reports coming from other Arab countries, like from Yemen and elsewhere, who like if the Egyptians can put Mubarak in a cage, then we can put, you know, I mean, Abdullah Salah in a cage, we can put, you know, I mean, Excel in a cage, we can put Y in a cage. And the domino effect was actually working. A month later, on the 9th of September, this was like a, a, a great day, where mass mobilizations, probably the biggest since February uh, 2011, descended on Tahrir Square, went to the interior ministry, which has always been a big taboo, defaced it completely, sprayed graffiti all over, <coughs> running the gate. And I don't know like, if there are any Egyptians here or people who lived in Egypt, they know quite well that, you know, this area has always been a big taboo. It, it would just send the chills if you just walk, you know, beside it, because that's the biggest torture factory we have in Egypt. So to break this taboo and descend on it, deface the entire building, take over the area around it, take over Tahrir, and then even other marshes decided, well, let's take over the Israeli embassy, you know, by the way. So, you know, they headed to the Israeli embassy, which was the 14th floor. was like 13 floors, and they stormed the Israeli embassy, and they were like taking documents and like throwing it out. I mean, this was completely like surreal for us. And I remember I was like calling up, you know, all my friends who were uh, saying, oh, the revolution is lost, the revolution is blah, 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 you know, turn on your TV and watch us, uh, what we're doing now. Um, following these events, September, October, with, we, we call it even like the Red October, because after all of these mobilizations, mainly by the activist community, that started spilling over to the working class once again. So September and October, you had roughly 750,000 Egyptian workers, three quarters of a million, and this is one of the biggest mobilizations ever, going on strike in very vital sectors like the public transport and among the teachers, um, striking over mainly ridding the sectors of corruption, taking the hands of the military off the management, in addition to calling for bread and butter issues, improving work conditions. Now, these strikes were happening, and the junta could not basically deal with it at all. Even when they legislated an anti-strike law, which was very similar to, to actually the laws of Nazi Germany, and we didn't have those laws even uh, when Mubarak was ruling, these laws were basically nullified. You know, it, it, it's, it's as if like, they don't exist anymore. With like, those hundreds of thousands of workers striking. 
Things even culminated on the 19th of November with a mini uprising that was known as the Muhammad Ahmed Street Uprising. And I'm sure that you're, you're quite familiar with the pictures and the visuals, you know, I mean, from it, where day after day, thousands and thousands of Egyptian revolutionaries were fighting heroically the police in that street in downtown Cairo, and victims and martyrs were falling, but still, you know, I mean, the clashes continued, and they only fizzled, you know, I mean, suddenly, when most of the political forces decided to pull from Tahrir and go to the parliamentary elections. So that's when the mobilization fizzled. And of course, with the elections, who took the upper hand? Mainly the Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis. While I started hearing the same people wailing and crying again, the revolution is lost, the revolution is lost, you know, it's the Islamists who took over after all of this, blah, blah, blah. And what we were arguing is that actually this is going to put the Islamists in one hell of an embarrassing situation. The Islamists have not been mobilizing since Mubarak's fall. And more or less they have denounced most of our mobilizations in Tahrir using the same rhetoric and lingo of SCAF. And they have been calming down their young cadres, asking them not to intervene in those protests. Let's take over the parliament and we'll achieve the demands of the revolution. And of course, the performance in that parliament was quite a disgrace. Quite a disgrace, why? In the midst of, for example, in the midst of one of the biggest transport strikes in Alexandria and Cairo, our parliamentary transportation committee was discussing banning porno websites. So, in the midst of hundreds of thousands of transport workers going on strike, and these are supposedly the parliamentarians who would deal with that issue, they were instead discussing banning and censoring porno websites. No wonder when that parliament was dissolved by the army tanks months later, no one really went to defend it. Where were the millions, you know, people who voted for it? They got completely alienated. Um, let me also fast forward to February 11th. Uh, it's quite an important date, because on that day, the revolutionary forces in Egypt, I'm talking here about February 11th, 2012 of this year, on the anniversary of Mubarak's toppling, who, who was toppled at the end of the day not by us in Tahrir, although I am very proud of our role in Tahrir, but he was toppled by the mass strikes that broke out on the 8th, on the 9th, on the 10th, and the 11th of February 2011, and while the activist community suspended the sit-in and left Tahrir, the workers and the industrial actions continued uh, later. So there were wide calls for, for a general strike on February 11th. And these calls were also endorsed by the Independent Union Federation, which was declared last year uh, uh, in the midst of the uprising in Tahrir Square. And it has been growing steadily. And now on paper, they at least have two million uh, uh, workers. Um, uh, who are members of that federation. But I'm going to speak a little bit more about that federation because there are also many problems with that federation that need to be tackled. So, on that day, February 11th, everybody was calling for like civil disobedience, everybody was calling like, you know, I mean, for mass strikes to take place on that day. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis at the time actually decided not to take part and they started disseminating propaganda and posters together with the army asking people to work more on that day, to add more to the work effort. Egypt does not need strikes now. These strikes are going to disrupt you know, the economy. We need some stability. They were using the same rhetoric as the, as, as the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. These are the military junta, And, of course, the liberal capitalists that we have in Egypt. Our position in February 11th as a revolutionary socialist was the following. We knew that actually the general strike is not going to take place, it's not going to materialize. Why? General strikes cannot be organized by Facebook. General strikes cannot be organized by Twitter. General strikes cannot be organized by groups who do not have enough presence on the ground at the end of the day. It's not like, you know, I mean, some worker will get on Facebook, oh, there is tomorrow, like, a total of genocide. like, okay, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm striking. It doesn't work this way. You gotta have some fighting organization on the ground. And by that, I mean either a revolutionary party that's, like, rooted well enough in the workplaces or throughout the country, 
or an independent union federation with real presence in the workplaces that can push this forward. So of course we knew that it's not going to happen. We don't have these objective conditions to start with. But at the same time, we knew that it was going to be successful at the universities. Why? Because at the universities, you do have these fighting machines. I mean, the revolutionary socialists, they do have a like, very strong presence in at least like 18 universities. Uh, other revolutionary groups also have, uh, uh, like, they are quite prudent um, on the campuses. In addition to the rise of independent student unions following Mubarak's uh, uh, fall. So, we knew that there were actually structures on the ground that can shut down the universities. And it happened. And it was extremely successful. And it was extremely radicalizing for so many young students. And we witnessed another thing that was unprecedented and unseen since the 1919 revolution, which was the participation of school students. This is something unprecedented. I mean, I recall in the protests around the year 2000 with the Palestinian Intifada, um, there, there was like a modest participation by school students, but in general, school students had, were not really part of the political spectrum in Egypt since the 1919 revolution. But on that day, you know, school students went on strike, they mobilized protests and marches to our amazement. You know, we were all surprised that this was taking place. And at the same time, unfortunately, the same chorus in the activist community that's extremely dismissive of strikes in general and the labor movement because the workers are not talking politics, they are not raising demands about the constitution, they are not discussing like you know, in the court like in the parliament, they are only like striking over you know, their own issues. They took it as a chance to start slagging off the labor movement once again, repeating you know, I mean, the same arguments. In addition to the same chorus that repeats every couple of weeks, the revolution is lost, the revolution is lost, the revolution is lost, as always. But, as always, the labor movement actually, you know, managed to crush them back and embarrass them. Because even when the labor movement did not respond to the calls of February 11th, I mean, the whole atmosphere is quite charged. And the workers could see, you know, the kind of mobilizations that were going on. And it's not like the workers were like staying at their homes, you know, in the months before. They were striking. Maybe in, in September, October, November, December, you know, there wasn't like much industrial actions. January also, I mean, that, there wasn't that much. But suddenly it's like opening the Pandora's box and strikes were taking place everywhere. Everywhere. And interestingly, you started hearing chants from the workers, probably for the first time, down with military rule. Just to an And you started finding demands being put forward by some sectors of the labor movement, especially those who work in the ports and the harbors, calling for the demilitarization of the management. In Egypt, SCAF is the biggest capitalist we have. They control roughly from 20 to 25 percent of our economy. They produce everything from cooking pans, forks and knives, and macarona and pasta, all the way to missiles. They are involved so much in the industrial uh, civilian sector. So, of course, when workers go on strike against their managers, who are actually generals, it's quite inevitable that they will start crystallizing about it politically. So, during these two months, I mean, we witnessed last like, we could not like, cope. I mean, as socialists, I mean, we were running like, you know, everywhere, uh, trying to cope, you know, the situation was happening, you know, trying to coordinate between everybody. Um, and it was fantastic times, I have to say. But the industrial action curve started also to go down, to go down during the months of um, May and June. Why is that? Because we had the presidential elections. And the kind of hysteria that the regime was disseminating in the news and in the mainstream media was amazing. I mean, from all sorts of conspiracies that, you know, if, um, if someone, if a revolutionary candidate wins, Israel is going to invade the next day. Uh, Palestinians are, like, infiltrating Egypt, and they are the ones who killed the testers in Tahrir. Um, uh, yeah, actually, the official investigation we had um, uh, reached the conclusion that those who killed protesters in Tahrir were Iranians, Palestinians, Mossad agents, and Blackwater mercenaries. Anyone but Egyptian police. 
and they were coming back to operate once again. Um, the kind of hysteria also, I mean, reached the extent that they would create or fabricate um, crises when it comes to gasoline, when it comes to uh, fuel, car fuel, when it comes to electric cars, water. I mean, it was terror warfare by the military junta, uh, basically. And strikes fizzled uh, by that time. But even if you look at the stats, by the second round, already in the run-up to the second round, the curve had been going up a little bit when it comes to the strikes. And with the election of Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president, I mean, it's like hell broke loose. Um, every single person with a problem in this country is now descending on the presidential palace, asking Mohammed Morsi, who presented himself as the revolutionary candidate, well, if you're the revolutionary candidate, solve our problems. Okay. And it's not just like labor protesters from every single, you know, I mean, province who are descending, but even people with personal problems, like, you know, a man who just got divorced, you know, from his wife, and is like, you know, he upset, so he goes to the presidential palace. It's so, like, uh, seriously, um, I'm not joking, this is serious. This is serious. And, uh, uh, like, someone would get into a fight with his neighbor, so he would go, like, you know, to the presidential palace and start, like, you know, he knocking on the doors. And once again, you know, I mean, for someone like me, who comes from the 1990s, and know that this presidential palace was quite a taboo, we never approached the presidential palace, until February 11, 2011, the last day of the uprising, when hundreds of thousands, not hundreds, but like tens of thousands of protesters marched from Tahrir over the presidential palace chanting, Mubarak, we're, we're gonna get you from your bedroom. And since that day, you know, I mean, there were no mobilizations whatsoever that happened around that palace. Now, if you look at the news, every day, you know, I mean, there are protests, there are workers who are striking, and they are taken to the streets surrounding that presidential uh, 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 palace. Now, where is that going to lead us? Of course, I mean, I've tried my share of predictions before, so, you know, I, I don't want to, like, you know, I mean, keep on uh, predicting things. Uh, no one can predict, you know, I mean, anything in the revolution. But there are, like, few, maybe a couple of points that I want to stress uh, before I, uh, before I uh, uh, wrap up. Um, number one is that at the moment, Although there are many secular activists who are not freaking out, oh my god, the revolution is lost, yeah, I mean, the same chorus is back again, the revolution is lost, you know, I mean, now we have the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, I mean, in power. Actually, I don't think that the Muslim Brotherhood has, has ever been in such a critical position as they are today. This organization is not homogeneous. This organization is also not fascist. This organization, its leadership, comes indeed from the capitalist class, they come from a bourgeois background, they include in their guidance bureau, which is their like put, put, uh, like put bureau, uh, 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 multi-millionaires like Hayat Shatter, who are even more neoliberal than Hosni Mubarak uh, and his junta. Even despite that, the bulk of the organization is quite different. The leadership is reactionary, is reformist, is opportunist, just like the Labour Party here in Britain. But at the same time, the base cadres, they are moving in a different direction. The Muslim Brotherhood, the bulk of the organization consists of lower middle class, middle class professionals, in addition to also following among the labor sector and among some farmers in Egypt. When Mohammed Morsi speaks about Islamic Sharia, maybe the Islamic Sharia he has in his head translates into neoliberal laws. But for the Muslim Brotherhood worker, it actually means social justice. When Hayat Shatter speaks about the Renaissance project, Mashur al Nahba, as they called it, maybe he's discussing or he has in his mind, that or and already they proposed it, anti union laws, but at the same time, their base cadres, for them, the Renaissance project is about increasing their wages, it's about empowering them in the workplace, it's about achieving social justice and all the other things. And the, any religious ideology in general, or any reformist ideology, can always blur those class lines until actually this movement is in power. And when this movement starts taking decisions, more or less. And that's when you can start seeing the reality, that they are not unified. They are not a homogeneous bloc. And even all throughout this last year, from February till today, 
Although the Muslim Brotherhood refrained from organizing, refrained from mobilizing in Tahrir Square, refrained from taking part in the strikes and the mobilizations against the army junta, I swear there is not a single clash with the police that I attended, and I didn't see young Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, members with us who disobeyed uh, the organizational uh, commands, and they were with us uh, fighting the police. And they were with us uh, fighting the police. Interestingly, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood officially did not endorse the January uprising until the Friday of anger, 28th of January. And this was the day when, uh, I mean, basically, hell broke loose. We burned down like 190 police stations. We burned down the world. <laughs> These police stations, once again, are torture factories. Anyone who is familiar with the Egyptian situation knows quite well that the biggest crime syndicate we have in Egypt is actually the police, the Interior Ministry. And those stations, for the ordinary Egyptians, they are torture factories. 190 police stations were burned simultaneously on that day. Um, the Interior Ministry was almost stormed, but they managed to, uh, to push us back, you know, I mean, by brute force, and many people unfortunately died in that process. And, but from January 25th, January 26th, January 27th, there were young Muslim Brotherhood activists with us on the streets. There were young Salafis, you know, with us on the streets. And the leadership knew quite well on January 28th that if they do not endorse the uprising, it's coming, it's coming, and they're going to lose everything. And that's when they endorsed it. But they endorsed it, their leaders were trying to reach all sorts of compromises with Omar Sulaiman, and the other uh, uh, figures from the regime, while the base cadres were with us in Tahrir fighting to death during the Battle of the Camel and during other situations. And again, there were splits all over uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, a year later. Splits that secular activists in general do not take seriously. And they always like to portray it as some like conspiracy. The, the Muslim Brotherhood are like, you know, pretending that. Uh, we are supporting uprising, but they are not. And when you find the youth, actually they are moving on commands from the, from the leadership so as not to lose the ground. That's not true. And I'm also familiar with many Muslim Brotherhood activists who actually resigned after the November uprising and after the lingo that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, used uh, against them. Um, the final point uh, probably I want to make, and then we can discuss more details um, about the related issues, is that the question of organization. I mean, definitely, when this uprising started, um, even when we were in the heart of it, and we were on the streets as revolutionary socialists from the first day, we cannot claim that we are providing leadership for that uprising. Even when among the left in general, we enjoy the biggest presence among the industrial urban centers, but again, we cannot really claim that we are the ones who are instigating all of those strikes. The strikes in Egypt are still largely spontaneous. But there is a common denominator between all of them. This common denominator is usually purging the management from the regime officials uh, who more or less sabotaged those workplaces by their neoliberal uh, policies. And the second thing is job security. I mean, I'm 34 years old. I've, I've been working as a journalist since I was like 22, probably. And I never had a contract in my life. I never had a contract in my life. And I, I come from middle class background. So you can imagine, like, you know, blue collar and white collar you know, workers who are even in a much more less privileged, uh, or less privileged, you know, I mean, than me, you can imagine their lives in general. Uh, workers in Mahalla, for example, before, okay, all right. Workers in Mahalla, for example, before they, they, they take up a job or before they get employed, they sign uh, the resignations with blank dates, or they resign, or they sign IOUs, you know, with like blank uh, 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 figures that the management can put IOU one million Egyptian pounds, and that's being used, you know, I mean, as a sword against the workers. So the two common like the common denominator between all of those strikes, even when they are spontaneous, are these two demands. If there was a fighting organization, a fighting organization meaning a revolutionary socialist organization, rooted deeply in the workplaces, 
I think we would have been in a completely different position today. And the final thing I want to say, this is a very lovely problem. I mean, definitely, and you as socialists, when you come to Marxism and you meet all of those great people and you discuss politics, you definitely feel empowered. But then after Marxism is over, you're going to go back to your branches, to your Saturday sales, and probably there will be three or four of you, you know, I mean, standing on some corner, selling, you know, selling socialist worker. You might feel alone, okay? You might feel isolated. You might, on occasions, feel that it's completely crazy. You know what you're doing? I mean, what are the global revolutions? But what I can assure you is that in another continent, in Egypt, there are comrades, you know, they, your own comrades are doing the same thing. They are doing also the paper sales. They are doing the same things, leafleting everything that you do. But they are coming under fire. They are coming under bullets. They are coming under BB, you know, I mean bullets. They are coming under rubber bullets. They are coming under all sorts of oppression. They are being imprisoned. They are being tortured. You know, I mean, in jails. The Egyptian revolution, as much as we are fortunate, you know, and, and I definitely feel very grateful that I've witnessed it and I'm taking part in it, we understand quite well that we will not succeed until this revolution spreads, not just spreads in the Arab world, but also to the industrial West, to Western Europe. If you think that it's a crazy idea to have a revolution in Britain, I can assure you. There was the same audience in Egypt two months before the revolution who were repeating that course. So comrades, you know, I really urge you to continue building your own organization, to keep engaging in the industrial actions here in Britain. Because every victory you achieve here, I can assure you, it's a victory for us in Egypt. And every defeat we face in Egypt is going to be a defeat for you. So again, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. And I wish you all the luck with building your organization here because more or less the lives of so many people in other parts of the world, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on your efforts here. Thank you. Push. 
children shook by thousands of other people, and I had tears in my eyes because of the fear of losing my mum. It was still breathtakingly beautiful. To see the struggle of ordinary people like me and mum fight back, and I want that. I want to see hundreds of thousands of people in squares of Britain fighting for what's right and what's good. I want a revolution, and I won't stop until I have one. And in Sudan, 
We need your solidarity. As a European, our comrades everywhere, especially from our comrades, Hassan and his colleagues, because we need their experience until we see our President Omar al Bashir in the cage pavilion. as well as, of course, uh, being excited as all of you are by the event. So I want to address some of the challenges. And the challenges are very serious challenges. They're wonderful challenges to have, but extremely serious challenges that they're facing in Egypt. It's only uh, a couple of weeks ago that those of you following these events closely would have noticed that the SCAF, the generals, launched what people have called a soft coup. Um, they threw down a major challenge to the whole revolutionary movement and they would have loved to, and they would love to, move towards what was what we might call a hard coup. A confrontation with the revolutionary movement as a whole. Out of revenge, because they had enormous interest to defend, because as Hassan said, the military are embedded in Egyptian capitalism. And also because they're under enormous international pressure to solve some of the problems in Egypt. The World Bank, the IMF, the American administration want to bring this movement to an end because the longer it goes on, the greater the dangers of contagion that Charlie referred to. And they've been watching, the generals are watching the events very, very closely, just as closely as we watched. And they have identified certain weaknesses in the movement, not very surprisingly. One of the most important weaknesses that they noticed which you catch the timing of their so-called soft coup, was the inability of the revolutionary movement to cohere in the elections, and particularly in the presidential elections. Because there was a great deal of disarray and confusion in the elections. There was a very strong um, current running, particularly on the active activists of the streets, which said we should boycott the elections. No engagement with elections under military rule. And this almost handed the generals their election. It almost put their man, Ahmed Shafiq, in power. And Shafiq had made it quite clear with chilling warnings that he would take the initiative as an if elected president and that their blood would run in the streets of Egypt's cities. Now, we know that notwithstanding all its great achievements, the workers' movement in Egypt remained an uneven movement. Sam has explained that to us quite clearly. Under these circumstances, electoral politics becomes more important. And it's quite mad and suicidal not to engage in every area of the political arena, including the electoral arena. This is, this is something we've learned from a Marxist tradition which goes back for generations and has passed through the experiences of numerous uh, revolutionary crises. And so one of the challenges for the left now, and I've asked Hossam to comment on this, is how the left, and particularly the revolutionary Marxist tradition, which understands the challenges and the dangers of these situations, are putting together, or helping to put together, an effectual, effective electoral program which can draw together all those currents that are committed to maintain the revolution, and by so doing, spell out to the military the enormous cost and the enormous challenge of mounting um, an outright counter-revolution. Last point. I was privileged, like a number of comrades here, including Rosa who spoke earlier, to go on some of the most stupendous demonstrations I've ever participated in, just a few weeks ago in early June in Cairo. And the twin key slogans of these demonstrations were, on the one hand, Fowler, Fowler, revolution, revolution. And secondly, in a way even more important, the slogan, never going back. People say we're never going back. And they're never going back because they dare not go back to the Mubarak era, in which the Mubarak state invaded the lives of every Egyptian family and were prepared to murder hundreds of thousands of people over the course of time and murder people in the streets at the start of the revolution. Never going back. To ensure that we never go back, we have to address these key challenges for the revolutionary left with great urgency. I think that it's very important if we want to understand the revolution, to, as Fusano said, not to sort of generalize, I guess, too much the event, but maybe it would help to look at it as 
sort of divided in three phases from the pre-revolution, like the June 2010 experience, the tipping point itself between January and March, and then the post-revolution. And many of us have said, actually, during January and February, although this is very difficult and heroic, this is actually not the most difficult part. The most difficult part is still going to come in the post-revolutionary era. And I think this is what we are seeing now. And I think three important things that I, I observe relating to this post-revolutionary challenge is, the first thing is how do you relate to other social forces? And I guess the question is, especially the most important agent of change, forces of people collected as a class. And, and I think you spoke brilliantly about how some uh, groups, especially the revolutionary socialists, managed to do that. And then secondly, how do you relate to demands and social rights of other minority groups? And I think we've seen some harsh confrontations between uh, the, the state and the military, and for instance, women who went on women marches, or minorities like the cops, and harsh, harsh, brutal confrontation. I guess the challenge also in that situation is how do you integrate demands of minority group in the revolutionary demands to prevent previous experiences of revolutions where revolutionaries would say, no, these are secondary issues. First, we need to get to the main issues. We deal with women rights and other rights later. I think that's also something interesting. I want to hear your comments about how do you deal with that. And the last point, I guess, also analysis of strategy and tactics. And there have been many discussions in Marxism this year, and one of the discussions that stayed with me most vividly is one I have personally with Samir Amin. And I was frankly, I hope he's there, so I want to continue the discussion. But I was a bit shocked, actually, that the way people like Samir Amin and others conflate, basically, staff and, and counter-revolutionary um, forces with the Muslim Brotherhood as if it's one and the same thing. And my uh, humble analysis, and I would like to hear your uh, comment on this, is how I see it is that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood winning the elections should be seen as not like, oh, I'm happy the Muslim Brotherhood won, but I'm happy the Scott didn't win. And that's a very different perspective on how we deal with it. Because in, I think the Muslim Brotherhood winning it can be part of the counter-revolution, but it allowed a bit of space with which we can continue these, the, the defense of the revolution. Whereas if the scuff had won, it would have closed that space. And I think that your piece on, what was it, uh, never with the state, sometimes with, uh, with Islam, is a very good starting point. Maybe you can remind some of the other people what you essentially wrote in that piece. Well, I think the, uh, the development of the Egyptian revolution uh, and its absolutely explosive impact on a global scale, as well as the dramatic uh, transformation that is uh, uh, trending, if you like, and moving forward in Egypt itself, is a very important confirmation of something that is central to our political tradition and to the political tradition that goes uh, back to Lenin, in that we understand that revolution is something where the, the entirety of society, if you like, is thrown into turmoil. All sorts of groups, uh, if you like, emerge uh, and are in flux. And uh, the tradition of Leninism, which our comrades have understood, particularly in relation to how we relate to a revolution that has a significant Islamic character and where there is organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood that are playing a central uh, role in it, was not to be dismissive, not to say that is not our politics, it's not uh, pure socialist politics, uh, but is to understand that this is an elemental movement of the people that can gain expression through all sorts of means, and of course people will pick up the means that are there and available uh, and express it through the traditions uh, that, they, uh, that they have. And it reminds me of the debate about the 1916 rising and how Lenin respond to that rising, which had a nationalist and Catholic character, but which was dismissed by many on the left at the time, uh, as being petty bourgeois, nationalist, irrelevant. And Lenin says, uh, if you imagine that a socialist revolution is the working class lining up on one side with red flags, and the bourgeoisie lining up on the other, you will never see, you will never live to see a revolution. In reality, a revolution is all sorts of groups ideas, traditions, thrown into turmoil, thrown up against the contradictions uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the system. And the first thing about revolutionaries is that we relate to it as our comrades have, and as we as a tradition, if you like, have related and understood 
the elemental, the enormous significance of the Egyptian revolution for the prospects of international and global revolution and that has begun to light a fire across the world. But I just finish with this. In that situation, there are many challenges, many difficulties, many threats of the old regime coming back to smash, to contain, uh, that the Islamic ideas are very contradictory, that you know, the Muslim Brotherhood who are rich capitalists as against the ordinary Muslims who uh, actually demand jobs, justice and freedom. And what James Connolly said in the context of the Irish Revolution, he said, the Irish working class are the incorruptible fighters for Irish freedom. Take out the Irish and say this, the working class are the incorruptible fighters for human liberation. That is, that is the anchor, that idea is the anchor that will allow us to navigate the challenges, the twists and turns, the dangers that face the Egyptian revolution, but also in our own process of uh, resistance moving to revolution in the Western uh, world. And the greatest solidarity we can give to the Egyptian revolution is to spread that spirit of revolt and revolution over the central understanding is that the working class are the incorruptible fighters who will carry that revolution through to its end. Okay, I'll, I'll try to address a couple of questions uh, as fast as I can, or as brief as I can. Uh, there is no question that uh, there is no one more afraid than the Egyptians about the prospects of the spread of the revolution to Sudan. Uh, definitely. Historically, by the way, the Sudanese Communist Party was built in Cairo University. There isn't anything that happens in Egypt that does not spill over Sudan, and there isn't anything that happens in Sudan that does not spill over, you know, I mean, in Egypt. And definitely it would be one hell of a strategic step forward if our Sudanese brothers and sisters manage to topple the regime over there. That will give us a boost uh, for it. The other thing uh, related to the brief question about the lower middle class and the middle class, um, they were referred to as unorganized. Actually, they are the most organized. Uh, it's the working class that's not organized enough. Uh, the lower middle class and the middle class, they, are, they constitute the bulk, actually, of the political forces uh, that we have in Egypt and who are operating on the ground. Um, but the main challenges, actually, that we face is with the industrial sector. It's, it's the most difficult, definitely, to organize. And we have a long tradition of nationalism and populism, in addition to repression and what we call a yellow bureaucracy of the unions. Um, the question uh, my, uh, my comrade raised about the rights of women, minorities, um, it's, it's very crucial. Actually, in the same, yes, we have the chorus of the revolution that has been lost, and we have another chorus that say, now it's not the time for this. This other chorus always comes out whenever women try to mobilize actually for protests. This chorus comes out whenever we try to hold any protests about Palestine. They're like, why do we say about Palestine now? You know what I mean? We have a revolution, you know what I mean, here. The same chorus comes out, you know, when the cops start demonstrating over, you know, their own issue. We do have this. It's, it's a big challenge. Um, and it's a challenge on the shoulders, mainly, of revolutionaries on the left to try to come up with a discourse that links all of this together. Again, I mean, what Richard, uh, Richard has been quoting Lenin, and it, I mean, we've been quoting that quote a lot in Egypt, is that those who expect some pure revolution, you know, I mean, with the workers standing on one side with the workers, you know, and the other side is the capitalists saying, well, the capitalists, you'll never, you'll never see this revolution. Um, so definitely, it's a big challenge, and I'm not saying that we're that successful. You know, even yet, in coming up with this discourse, but it's among the tons of challenges uh, we have, and we cannot postpone those battles at all. We cannot fall into the same mistakes as other revolutions, you know, I mean, did in the past. Um, regarding what Phil uh, brought, uh, brought up um, about elections, it's also another difficult argument that we're always into. Um, especially, you have to also uh, uh, think about the nature of the revolutionary socialists at the moment. Following the November uprising, which we were at the heart of it, and we received the biggest attacks by staff and by the sensationalist media, who were like disseminating like all sorts of lies and misinformation uh, about us, you know, on TV, on the internet, 
helping the Salafis and the Islamists too, who were part of their campaign against us, including all the revolutionary socialists and behind all the violence that's happening, they are trying to burn down uh, uh, the parliament, they want to destroy, you know, I mean, the state. Our campaign, our counter campaign was not, yeah, actually, we want to destroy the state. <laughs> we do want to destroy the state. We want to destroy the state that we have and build a just state, a worker state, uh, uh, to replace it. And the time, I mean, there, there have been like tons and tons of like young people who joined us uh, after the November uprising. And it's mainly the hardcore street fighters who were there at the front lines of Muhammad Mahmoud with us. And for many of those young new comrades, for them, revolution is about clashes. It's about like, you know, I mean, what you do in the streets. It's about confronting the police. So the whole idea of getting into elections, then you're setting up. Uh, but it's part of also our arguments and discussions that, you know, we're having on a daily basis. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Um, the, the, the last question um, I want to address is something about the tourism uh, workers. Uh, this question also, I think it was the first question raised by a comrade. The working class in Egypt is roughly more than 25 million workers out of a nation of 90 million uh, uh, workers. Uh, sorry, 90 million uh, uh, people. And definitely there are unevens. You know, there are sectors that are progressive and in the forefront of the confrontation, you know, I mean, with the army and with the regime. And there are other sectors that are still lagging behind, or the consciousness of the workers is extremely uneven. Even inside every single sector and every single company, you will find workers who are at the front lines, but at the same time, workers within the same factory who are not really sure about what's going on. The tourism workers in specific has been a very contentious issue. It's, a, it's an industry that largely depends on stability, on the flow of foreign tourists, and it was hard hit, very hardly hit, uh, by the revolution afterwards. What we are trying to do is also to come up with a discourse to try to win over those workers to the side of the revolution. And it's not like you know, those workers necessarily are like you know, all counter-revolutionaries, you know, it's not true. But you are trying to push for uh, a state fund in order to uh, uh, compensate them in times of crisis. And that's a demand that we're trying to push forward. Um, workers, when you go to Egypt and you, know, you pay any bill, you know, at any hotel or anything, you know, there is always a 12%, uh, uh, and it's called a service rate. These 12%, they never go to the workers. They actually go to the management. And one of the fights that we are having now in that sector, it's about getting those 12% to the working class, uh, to those who work in tourism. So this can like, you know, balance a little bit the situation. Finally, and I'm sorry for taking this so long of my time, the workers' consciousness is sometimes contradictory and it's very uneven. Meaning, I could be with, for example, the oil workers last year, they were demonstrating in front of the Prime Minister's office, in the presence of the military police, and they were carrying rocks and like, you know, I mean, keep on banging, you know, I mean, on, on, on the guy's door, on the Prime Minister's door. And then, you know, one of them just looked at me and he said, by the way, you know, we're not into demonstrations. This is just yeah. a protest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like, we're not into demonstrations, but this is a protest. We're into protest. So, I mean, yes, I mean, you are actually demonstrating, you are protesting, you know. But for many of them, they still don't find this link between what they are doing and what the revolutionaries are doing in Tahrir. And it's a link and a bridge that we have to create. And the slogan that the revolutionary socialists have raised is that the square and the factory, one hand. Thank you. Three quick points to raise. Firstly, the question raised by Maria is absolutely central. The analysis of Islamism by uh, our own tradition, Tresham and so on, but above by the revolutionary socialists, is of great importance, of not conflating the Muslim Brotherhood with the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. It's incredibly important that this is done, to recognize that the defeat of Shafiq was important in terms of creating a space for the movement to develop and to act as some form of block against the attempt to crush the revolution. The importance, therefore, of voting for, for the Morsi in the second round of the elections. And without that, it is, for example, a disgrace that sections of the left in Britain seem to find it inconceivable that one could ever vote 
for someone who is a Muslim. They find it very hard to think that we can line up with such forces. Or that in Egypt itself, the sections of the left actually called for a vote for Shafiq because uh, they are so terrified at the prospect of a Muslim getting into the presidential palace that they would rather give a tick against the butcher of the revolution than see the Muslim Brotherhood in, 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 in office. And therefore the analysis that uh, Osama has developed and that has developed is of great importance. Secondly, the bringing together of the squares and the factories. Those two movements is the path to success of the Egyptian revolution. That will come about through the struggles in the workplaces, in the colleges and the universities, the occupations, the mass demonstrations and the strike. I want to agree with Phil Lars, I think the elections can be part of that process. That uh, even at the highest points of the most revolutionary movements, it's necessary to think how elections can be used in that way. The high points of the German Revolution in 1918-1919, when the German Communist Party was being formed, there's a famous debate which goes on. Here was a movement whose Akeda were drawn from the front ranks of the revolution, who brought down the Kaiser, who were seeing shooting in the streets, who were seeing great mass movements. And Luxembourg and Liebknecht argued that there must be contestation of the elections that were coming up. They lost that argument. It was a step backwards for the movement. It was a missed opportunity to unify the movement and to create a new base for the movement to go forwards. The, the destruction of the state sometimes requires detours, and one of those detours at the moment is the election process inside Egypt. We offer our absolute solidarity with uh, the comrades in Sudan, uh, with the comrades in Egypt. And I urge all of you to be part of that process of solidarity, but to also recognise that the revolutionary socialists are so crucial to the bringing together of the factories and the squares in Egypt. We also want to do the same here, to create a movement and a party that can bring together all the different issues facing the working class and the oppressed, and therefore to join the Socialist Workers' Party. Thank you.